where yeah. I where I got pissed off and I just took this fucking uh, dime bag Daryl guitar yeah. and I just and I dropped down on my knees and they just started smashing on the ground and splittered a bunch of pieces. <laughs> well, it was Dylan Dice's uh, guitar when him and Sonya broke up. He moved out and left it there, and she just threw it in the trash. And I went, hey, let me grab that. It'd be a cool prop. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I dig that, man. Well, why don't we just, like, yeah, I'm just going to fade in off of that, man. Hey, welcome to, uh, you know, to the Fools of Jason Froberg. We're just going to jump, jump right in here, man. Give us a, a like, subscribe, ring the bell. Uh, follow us on social media. Support us on Patreon and PayPal. And uh, today on the podcast, my very good longtime friend, Brian D. Litton. Uh, lead singer, guitar player of uh, Kill Jaden, and now the bassist of the Ghost LV Tribute, man. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome on the podcast. Already talking shit, already Thanks having a good time, me. man. Yeah, dude, thank you for being here, bro. It's fun. I'm glad you finally made it, bro. How's life treating you? Life's treating me good. Yeah? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Am I supposed to roll off of that? Or? Yeah, no, exactly. So uh, Really good. Really good, yeah. Okay, cool, man. <laughs> so now you came in to talk about your Ghost Tribute Band, man. When did you guys start that? I didn't know uh, I didn't know you were doing that. Oh, man. Um, I, 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 I was thinking it was three years. Uh, I think it was like four years ago we started, and we, we worked at it for probably the best of a year, most of a year. And then we played uh, one show. Then our keyboard player quit, and then we had to go back to the drawing board um, searching for a new keyboard player, which are very difficult to find with that genre of music, which is very uh, classical and uh, synthesizer. I mean, it, it's a big mix of type of keyboard styles. <clears throat> and um, ultimately, we ended up uh, getting a guy in L.A., to uh, and, um, record all the tracks for us. So uh, we, we asked him to join the band, but he, he's like, oh, no, man, this music's too satanic. <laughs> can't, can't do it, you know? And there's several musicians that just wouldn't, you know, they love the music, but they're like, they listen to lyrics. They're like, oh, no, uh-oh. And uh, so he tracked a bunch of, uh, of keyboards, and then uh, we got some karaoke-type, uh, background vocals, um, mixed them all together, and then we got back out playing, and um, it took off pretty fast. Took off in a big way. There was a lot of people who were scratching their heads, had their you know their arms folded, listening to us, not understanding who uh, who we were representing our tribute to, and what type of music and. And it's, you know, it's it's a different genre than your classic rock. And, but then the people that were, you know, true fans were right up in front wearing all the, 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 the merch, the shirts, the hats, and true diehards, you know. And, um, and so the people that were in the back were just wondering why are, were these people in the front so excited, you know, to be there witnessing that. And, and, um, uh, I think we've gained some fans, you know, from that aspect, and uh, more and more are crawling out of underneath a rock that we're always fans that are starting to show up, and it just it went from zero to a hundred really quick, uh, you know, from the uh, bunkhouse to uh, headlining at the House of Blues. Halloween yeah. night. <laughs> wow, that's pretty fantastic, yeah. man. That's a big show. It was it was good. It was packed. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Who are you playing with Halloween night over at the uh, House of Blues, man? Well, we're not playing this Halloween night. Oh, that, that night. That, that night, yeah. Oh. Like, what, what, was that, uh, what was that lineup like? What did what, what, you guys get into? Oh, God, I'd have to go back in the memory bank. Yeah. Monster Zero. Oh, I remember those fucking guys. Yeah, and Kevin from Monster Zero is uh, now our new guitar player. Oh yeah. Yeah, he's he's definitely been a an asset uh, to the band. He's definitely uh, injected some life into it with his capabilities of background vocals and and his guitar playing skills. And uh, he's always been a huge Ghost fan. So that's what you 
want as a as a a player in the band somebody who loves the music you know where to where i didn't i heard of the band yeah and alan the guitar player hit me up online he's like hey man do you want to play bass in this uh tribute band i go well, what band you know what are you tributing he goes uh <coughs> um ghost bc from um switzerland and i go well let me hear something he sent me three songs i said i'm in because i just was like boom that was it you yeah. know just grooving bass the bass is more like a lead guitar in this band where the bass runs are are not they're not simple they're um they they ride over the guitars a lot you know as opposed to the guitars riding over the bass so it's 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 an amazing uh, um, um, instrument to play in this band, for sure. Yeah, I love uh, I love whenever the bass player really takes over the uh, the lead role in the, in the band like oh, that. I bet man. you do. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it makes it real interesting. You know, so many bands, the bass player just kind of lies back and, and plays yeah. the root notes, and you know, and sometimes that's appropriate, but it's it's, it's a lot of fun whenever they uh, they they take a little more stride in their playing and their musicianship like that. Well, the songwriting in, in Ghost is uh, it's very complex. The, the compositions will flip from left to right and right to left. And if you're stoned, you might miss, you might <laughs> miss your left turn. <laughs> you really got to pay attention um, to the little nuances, little uh, off, off note keys that pop up here and there. Um, most people wouldn't write like that. And... Um, uh, Tobias is a he's a songwriter composer and um, he's very deep thinker as far as thinking outside of the four fours and the four fives and the three chord notes you know um, very uh, uh, he's a composer you know and, and interesting he, he he thinks outside the box but it, but you know he's he's not trying to do redo the beatles you know he's he's creating something um um nobody else is you know i mean yeah there's definitely nothing out there that's uh anywhere near what ghost is doing it's a very unique entity it is <laughs> i laugh because uh you know there's cartoons of a ghost music or ghost uh, they represent ghosts as like dark, evil, you know, vampires and stuff. And then, and then there's a meme where it's like uh, uh, Scooby Doo and the kids, you know, that, <laughs> like that's the music. <laughs> oh yeah, it's it's funny because it's 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 not you know thrash metal. It's not you know the hundred mile guitar solos. Very melodic, um, but then there's some really just raunchy, hard core riffs that you think all of a sudden you're playing slayer or something you know yeah you know you see pictures of them and like i have one pulled up right here on the uh on, off your instagram page which you guys' makeup is fantastic you do a, a great job with the props here um you know but you see you know stuff like this and you think that you're going to be going into like a, a black metal show like yeah. you're maybe hearing cradle of filth or something or demo boiger and then it's like where we're going to sacrifice a baby on stage or something yeah, you know? <laughs> right it's like way more harmonious and uh right and uh yeah it's 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 surprising to say the least man let me find a picture of you on your base here let me see here while i'm dicking around on your on your instagram a cool thing about uh playing in this band is the fact that uh um, looks great too that i'm wearing a mask and you've, you've you're in such cognito yeah you know you're like you're looking you're getting right in people's faces and they don't know who you are ha. and you can like it just makes you uh i don't know more confident more bold you know or having fun on stage like nobody knows who i am nobody knows who i am Unless they do know who I am. <laughs> Unless they do. Now they'll. Now the whole now world. The whole know. world's going to know. Gonna know. You've been on my podcast, so all, we're, all seventy people in the world are going to find out about you, bro. We're supposed to be the nameless ghouls, but now. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to walk around doing the, the, the Gene Simmons thing. Now. No one can tell you. you. Got the glasses on. I only said oh, yeah. your name once in the beginning of the podcast. Okay. Nobody knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, bro. So we've known each other for uh, quite a long time, actually, man. Like, uh, God, I'd say close to 15 years at this point. Uh, you were just, so you saw my 
Canyon Club uh, poster <laughs> in the, in the back bathroom memories. there. Where you were like, "Oh man, I was like, fuck, I guess I've known you forever." If yeah. you, if we get because we've. Yeah, I guess we went, we met back then. Were you still playing in Kill Jaden back then? Yeah, yeah, you've been doing the Kill Jaden thing forever, right? Well, we were we we're together for um, uh, eleven years, yeah. you know, from two thousand and uh, uh, four, five, all the way up to you know two thousand eleven or so. No, that's shit. Yeah, I broke up in eleven, and then I got it. Re- I got it back again, and I re I re got the guys back together, together again, and we played uh, uh, at Vamped on uh, December I'm gonna say 18th, opening for Damage Inc. And then COVID happened, oof. And it was like, oh man, we're just getting back together, and then and then you know life throws you a loop, and um, you know Ronnie moved to Florida. Uh, I'm expecting him to come back sometime. You know, in the near future, and you know, we we've got some uh, tracks that we did at Hit Track Studios, and um, I'm doing vocals at Dylan Dice's studio. Oh, I love Dylan. <laughs> Me too, man. He's such a great dude. Yeah, one of my best friends. I didn't know he had a studio in town. I'm gonna have to go hit him up and check out what he's got going on, man. Oh yeah, he's he's got a well. I think it's in house. I mean, last time I was there it was up in his attic. Yeah. He's got one of those consoles that, you know, I've, everybody talks about them, but I'm not too familiar. What, like the Raven touchscreen consoles? There, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. He's got, like, like, I got one right up there. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, well, he's got the, the, cool. the whole console, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah he has the desk that it yeah. sits inside of and everything like it's that. It's crazy. Yeah, that's nice, too. He's, he's definitely been chipping away, you know, with some uh, great engineers that have been teaching him a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. So I went and did um, some tracks on a song called "Beyond the Neon," and um, but I think I'm gonna change the the tuning from a um, a C to a D sharp. No, oh, yeah. I, I think it makes my my vocals. Uh, I push harder on a on a D than or a, yeah D than the C sharp. Oh, okay. Yeah, or C sharp to to D. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oopsies. Yeah, no. Yeah, I'm going to go in and re-record the whole damn thing, but, you know, more money. <laughs> but I Endless I just want I just want it be to, to, be, to be perfection, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we charge by the hour me and my uh me and my buddy were just talking about that uh just uh the whole uh, song rate that everyone tries to get out of you, oh, you know, because the artists, yeah. I, I just totally understand what they're, oh. what they're, where they're coming from, where they're like, they have a budget and they want to get so many songs recorded, you know, and it's just like uh, every time you do that, uh, you end up just working for free, basically, as opposed to and they're just like, nah, I gotta, I gotta give you an hourly thing, man. Yeah, you know, I mean, because you know, if they do one change, that that just you know, it takes more time. It takes forever, yeah. And then they, they keep coming back, and they're like, well, we paid you for the song. Can you just edit this one thing? And then they call you the next day. Uh, and then there's one more edit. And then you're know, like, okay, well, thank you. We're, we're about done here, right? And they're like, yeah, just, okay, can we just come in and recut the vocals real quick? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Fucking, man. Oh! <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. The endless, the endless song, the endless editing process of uh, recording uh, music. It, you, it's like a tattoo, you get what you pay for. Yeah, that's the truth, man. I know that. I know that firsthand. I am. I'm half my body is covered in dog <laughs> shit tattoos that <laughs> we've did ourselves. A lot of them, you know. Me and my friends built tattoo guns. And oh, uh, really? Yeah, when we were young, we couldn't wait, man. Uh-huh. We couldn't wait till we were eighteen, <laughs> and, uh, and so we made tattoo guns and started tattooing each other in, wow. our, in our buddy's garage. And I got this. this is the one that I still got right there, Buckland Slayer. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you went for it. <laughs> oh, bro. It looks like I was like, when are you going to get that fucking uh, fixed or whatever? I was like, it's perfect. It's, what are you talking about? It was free. You got yeah. what you paid for. <laughs> That's what a Slayer tattoo is supposed to fucking look like, bro. <laughs> like it's oh. been in hell for eternity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like you, like you got it in fucking prison. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's always best to, to spend the money on, on good artwork, man. Yep. And, and studio Especially time. Especially covering up a... 
an ex's name or something, you know? Ooh. <laughs> the name is always a curse, man. <laughs> you, whenever you get a, whenever you get a, a fucking lover's name put on your body, you're just, you're just completely cursing Asking the relationship. Yeah, yeah. You know, now just subconsciously, you're just like, it's, it's <laughs> that's yeah. fucking stuck with me forever. Oh. It's like, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I got to do something about this. <laughs> you definitely got to do something about it. Oh. <laughs> uh, Fuck, bro. <laughs> yeah, don't ever get uh, don't ever get your lover's name tattooed on your body. <clears throat> Never that's, again. Yeah, that's a bad one. That's a bad one, man. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah. So, anyways, back to playing music. Music. <laughs> Talking about fucking tattoos, man. Yeah. I gotta fuck. I gotta. I gotta go up to. We're gonna get some work done still, man. I am like itching for tattoo work. I'm uh, st- sticking with the tattoo thing. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Yeah. I'm fucking terrible at this. No, I, I have not had a tattoo <laughs> since the, the pandemic, bro. And it's driving me nuts. Have you got any tattoo work done recently? No. No? Um, a year before the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it's like three years now. Mm-hmm. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm working on a, on a piece right now for my neck. Oh, you're going for the neck, huh? Well, it's hardcore. Gonna, it's going to cover something up, you know? Ah. And yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's going to be hardcore. Yeah. You know, once you, once you go on your neck or your hands or your face, you know, you, 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 better, have, you better already have a, a good uh, retirement plan set up because uh, uh, getting hired yeah. to work at a bank ain't going to happen. <laughs> no, it's definitely not. <laughs> Although these days people are a little more flexible with it, which and is nice. That's, it is nice. I think that's the that's the been the the culture over the last twenty thirty years. You know, uh, at that one time tattoos were taboo and then acceptable, and then and then women started getting them, and then they became more acceptable, and then you know tattoos that that you know stuck out of a business shirt. You yeah. Know, uh, became access, uh, acceptable and and you know and a lot of people are doing the neck now you know and and in uh, in hands and i i i never understood i always thought like you know it's great to be all tatted up but you know that's that's your weekend look you know yeah exactly it's, it's not your uh, your 9 to 5 look you, you know if you want to have a, a career doing something you know long term but fortunately for me um, in my career, my, my business, I'm in construction. I, and I got earrings and I got tattoos and nose piercing and long hair. And it just, uh, it just, it, it just took a minute till they saw my set, my skill sets, you know, and now nobody sees the tattoos. Yeah. Nobody sees the earrings or the nose piercing. They just, they see me, you know, they see the guy who's getting it done. So that's the most important thing, you know, you know. Show up and make shit happen. No one will give a fuck what you got tattooed on you. No. Yeah, there's still corporations that, you know, won't hire people with, you know, those types of uh, oh yeah decorations and stuff. And, you know, they want the conservative look or whatever. And Yeah. Uh, the hell with them. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the decision you make, too, you know. People that go for it, they're just like, uh, I'm not not going to spend my life in a cubicle wearing a you know wearing a suit and tie and doing casual fridays and i just rather fucking die yeah be homeless you know and yeah just make sure that's uh that's going to happen and just put fuck right across your face <laughs> 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 not and you're in your cashier at a bank you know you're fuck on your fingers <laughs> yeah you know you'll, you'll you'll definitely uh you'll definitely keep yourself out of a cubicle that way Yep, you'll you'll be doing yourself a favor. Yeah, for you know? sure, for sure. You know, I I always uh, I'm you know I'm a musician, but I'm also a professional at what I do, and I know so many musicians that are are just musicians. You know, that's their livelihood. That's a rough life, man. As is an artist. You know, an artist doesn't know when their next uh, dollar's coming in when yeah. they're going to sell a piece. But they live a bohemian lifestyle that uh, doesn't subscribe to society's uh, um, model of what you're supposed to look like and how, where where you're supposed to work and you know how to, you know uh, you know contribute to your social security. There's people out there that that work 
uh, make money, ca- cash money, you know, and they don't sub- uh, prescribe to their social security uh, uh, retirement. You know, they're basically, you know, shooting craps, you know, on oh, yeah. their on their future. Roll and the and dice. What, what they're going to be like when they're, you know, 70 years old. But, you know, I don't think they think about that. I think they just think about today and what they're going to create. And oh, yeah. they have that. They, you got to have the belief that whatever you create, <clears throat> somebody's going to fall in love with and pay money for, which in turn pays for your studio, pays for your, your ink, you know, your paint, your, your food, your l- electricity. Oh, yeah. And I, I, it's just the bohemian lifestyle is always, uh, I was always uh, fascinated with it. You know, people who just... Uh, Pat their neck up and their whole face up and say, <laughs> you know what? This is this is who I am going to be, whether I um, survive or I starve to death. You yeah. Know? Ooh, more power to them. Hey, you know, you're going to fucking die anyways, man. You know, there's no uh, there's no escape in that uh, cold, hard fact. So it's like you might as well uh, live on your own terms while you're, uh, you know, in this incarnation. And, uh, and and do it do it do it to it, man. I agree. I agree. You know, fuck it, man. We we didn't take human birth to make corporations money. You uh, know? We came here to we came here to create art and and love and and have this wild experience, this crazy ride of a, a human birth. And yeah, I I what? love I love some of my friends that have their tongues split and their eyeballs tattooed and. They're just fucking wild yeah. people, man. They're some of my favorite people to be around. And, They're so uh, free spirited. Yeah, exactly, man. You know, living life yeah. to the fullest. It's <laughs> better than being mundane. You know, uh, uh, living in a cubicle, like you said. Yeah. You know, I, I I don't live in a cubicle. I I create yeah. what I do for a living. Is you know, I create, I build things, and uh, I get every. At the end of every day, I get to look back at what I did, you know, and, um, you know, I've been doing it for so long that I'm, I don't even put my hands on it. I just, just, you know, put the energy out to the crew <laughs> and that they put it together, you know, and I, I'm, I'm like a conductor. Uh, I'm a conductor, you know, oh, yeah. electricians go. That's where Plumbers you want to be, bro. Yeah. And I got a nice air conditioned office. It's out in the middle of the desert. And uh, it's very peaceful. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> I'm glad you made it that far in your career, man. Not a lot of people make it to that point where they're the you know supervising and, and leading uh, crews. Yeah, I've always uh, I manifested that my whole life. I always knew that you know at some point I'm going to be that guy that's uh, orchestrating the whole project. You know, schedules and change orders and. Uh, submittals transmittals and you know m- mocking up getting mock-ups of things of uh, products to see to, to be reviewed by the architect engineers and um you know i'm there and i've been there but then i wasn't there then i was there it's all about the economy when 2008 happened you know i had this big supermarket I was remodeling and then nothing you know and then I went back to being a carpenter and then I was a foreman and then I was the superintendent for the custom home division and then um, they they ate shit on that Um, they also did track houses anyhow they laid me off and then I became a bass player for Brent Muscat and the Saints of Las Vegas for two ah, years. I remember that band. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah. I went from getting up at uh, five in the morning to going to bed at five in the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bro. That's the truth, man. I That fucking uh, rock and roll lifestyle is a commitment, dude. It yeah. really is. It was fun, though. You know, yeah. That's all. I did work three days a week. Yeah. You know, and had a lot of time to myself. Uh, that was a... A growing time for me, you know, as far as uh, working in in my studio, writing, writing lyrics, you know, recording uh, demos and stuff like that, and working on the Saints Las Vegas music, which we had like I don't know a hundred songs, 
and uh, <laughs> he performed in front of thousands of people, and it was cool. It was a good experience. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, your whole life has to be revolved around that whenever you're doing that for a living. I remember that was like my whole twenties was uh, waking up at like three in the afternoon, <laughs> yeah. going to bed at six in the morning. Yeah. You know, just sun's like, coming up. It's like time to uh, blacken out the room. You know, that's it. Yeah, all the <laughs> all the rooms in my house had blackout <laughs> curtains in them, and it was just like a fucking cave, bro. I could stub my toe at at one in the afternoon. Yeah, you know, because it's so black. You go to the bathroom, you're like, boop. Oh, oh. absolutely. Which living in the desert, it's actually, uh, you know, out here in Vegas, it's a great way to do it because you know you just you're sleeping during the hottest parts of the day, and then you're up at night when yeah. it's perfect outside, and so you get the best parts of the yeah. of existing out here in the desert. You, know? you sure do. <clears throat> and you know, playing on the strip in front of you know thousands of tourists, that's just so fun. You know. Yeah. People getting up, dancing, and singing to all the music, and, you know, then you, you pack up at, after four sets, and, you know, you go home or go to another show, watch somebody else play. and Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's always the wildest thing, man, is like, uh, you know you've, you've got a job you you love whenever you wrap up what you're doing, and then you go to someone else doing the thing you just got doing yeah. for fun. You know, because yeah. you just love it so much. I, we, I, I'd always like a great example for me would be like when I was working in the House of Blues, we'd um, we'd wrap up for the night and then all of us would head over to Dive Bar and get shit faced till late uh, in the morning. There you go. You know, and it was just then we'd watch we'd watch like Brent Muscat and the Sin City Centers, you know, oh, yeah. kick ass all night long and we just have a blast. Yeah, no kidding, man. They used to, yeah, they used to play late. Um, remember they were um, residency on Tuesdays at the the first location. Yeah, uh, the original. Was, yeah, it was hard getting up to work the next day, but you know, <laughs> had to go check it out. <clears throat> oh, dude, I'd I'd leave dive bar, um, and like they'd we'd, they'd lock the doors, and we just hang out and drink, and uh, uh, and like it would be closed, you know, and it was just yeah. like friends and family just getting fucked up, and then. Uh, uh, we just be like, oh shit, we got a load in in thirty minutes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> and we just l go straight back to the House of Blues and like start unloading trucks and setting up shows for the day. What's that girl's name? Um, Stacy Dive or the blonde chick? Uh, she works there still. Angie? Angie Dive, yeah, that's yeah, it. yeah. She's still I love Angie. I saw Angie yesterday. Did you? Yeah. How's she doing? She's still beautiful. Yeah. Love you, I've, Angie. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't been there in a little bit, but yeah, she's always been cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, trying to get in, I'm trying to get involved with them a little bit more, hopefully, you know. Nothing official yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I got, the, I got a lot of speakers, and I want to uh, make that place fucking rock. It, like, I want it to fucking bang in there. Yeah, so, it needs something now. Yeah, it does. There was, a, there was issues make, with a lot of feedback and levels, and oh, yeah. before it was like... Their little board was like this big, you know. <laughs> yeah, dog. I put a I put a full size X thirty two in there, man. I got them a lighting console, installed a bunch of lights. Ooh. I got them six nice like EV wedges that like, you know, they're nothing fancy, but for die bar they work, man. Yeah, like, yeah. You can hear yourself. You can fucking. That's hear yourself. important. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to, you know, hopefully we. Uh, I was I was just talking to Nate yesterday, man. You know that place might be, that place might be fucking banging soon. Nice. It, it might really be like a a spot. A spot to fucking yeah. play. Instead of like you know kind of <laughs> dilapidated system like it's mm. been forever. You know, know, which yeah. is the dive bar. It's the dive bar. Who gives a shit, right? Yeah. But it'd be cooler if it was. Yeah, it was like fucking banging. Just you know? EQ'd, killer, you know, compressed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And speakers that work. And speakers that work. Speakers that work are important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes they wouldn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> Most of the time. Well, when you know when, you got, when you're all set up. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully, it was like one of the, so. my, my favorite spots to go fucking party, you know, and hang out and see some crazy shit. You know, so yeah, no, and, and hopefully, hopefully we we can make something work over there, and I'll have I'll have Nate on the show, and we'll be telling everybody about it and, and showing off. I'll have a bunch of fucking pictures and some videos of us putting some stuff together, and and you, there might be a there might be some really cool shit in the works over there, man. Mm. 
It'd be, it'd be really nice. The town needs it. So we lost a lot of we lost oh. a lot of good local venues here, man. I was thinking about all the places I played that are just gone. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, and people, you know, God bless them, man. They they would have the right intentions to open a club, and yeah. then after two hundred thousand dollars investment, you know, they're pulling out. You know, they're pulling all their kitchen equipment out and stage and lights and you know bar equipment and next thing you know it's a, a um um pay less shoe store yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> well opening a nightclub is one of the most risky and like fucking costly endeavors mm. and you're there's just no guarantees there's no guarantees there that you're going to make anything at all uh and and the hard part is like um, guarantees for your acts, you know, because you got an act that comes through and say they want five thousand dollars or eight thousand dollars. I mean, we're talking a smaller club, obviously, not like the House of Blues, where it was like even bigger acts than that. Right. But you pay the you pay the band their guarantee for them to show up, and that's the deal. And it doesn't matter how many tickets sell; they got their money, and mm-hmm. you're out that money. And that can that one show can fucking be just enough. To put you out. Put you out. You're just done. You're gonna have to close your doors. It yeah. makes the makes the promoter and the owner, the bar owner, club owner, have to work so much harder. You know, to reencoup their investment. Yeah, it's a crapshoot. It's really, really difficult to do, man. You know, it's really difficult to do. Yeah. And most places, if you can't if you can't float uh, float losses, if you don't have a, a deep enough pocketbook right. to like be able to float losses, or you run you run your ship like low enough overhead like dive does to where it doesn't fucking matter you know right. uh then it, it it'll cripple you and that's the, where a lot of places go down they'll go down on one or two shows they'll cut back on the uh you know um the maintenance the janitorial <laughs> they'll cut back on mopping <laughs> toilet cleaning you know i mean <laughs> all that just uh, next thing you know you're you're yeah. walking over a uh, week old throw up yeah exactly <laughs> well that's just part of that's just part of the uh the appeal for places the like ambience. dive or, or double down you know what i mean that's the yeah. ambiance they want you to to be terrified to touch the walls in the bathroom <laughs> 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 to flush the toilet <laughs> yeah oh bro <laughs> you know that's what you go there for and it's it's, it's authentic very much no oh, fuck man you know it's, it's like it's, la you walk down the street and uh there's chewing gum on the sidewalk from 1948, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking L.A. It's, it's dirty. Oh, L.A. is gross. Oh, right? They never heard of pressure washers or something? Yeah. God damn, dude. Mm. Used to be beautiful. It gets it keep getting, keeps getting worse every time I'm down there, man. It, uh, more and more ivy. Yeah. Overgrown, you know, buildings right next to buildings. I went to Chinatown and... Uh, the streets were enough just for one car to go through. <laughs> so if another car was coming the other way, they, you'd have to kind of like veer off to the to the to the curb so they can pass, or vice versa. You know. Yeah, one person has to make way. Yeah, that's a good that's a good place for a game of chicken. <laughs> right. <laughs> who's gonna Who's gonna pull over? Oh. Yeah, I hope they get their shit together because the beaches are beautiful out there, man. I used to love going down there and, like, uh, you know, hitting up the, uh, God, I can't think of it. Santa Monica. Santa Monica. Oh, the pier. Uh, Man, it's just, it was so much fun. You just walk up and down, hit the shops, goof off, man. See see the skaters skating in the skate park and, you know, and fuck, dude. It's just dilapidated. Full of fucking homeless people now. Yeah. where isn't yeah you know, i mean like they're everywhere yeah it's a it's a disaster nothing man. against them but you know it's just like oh yeah it's sad to see so many people that broken you know yeah it is and like the system's fucking hard man you know you you it, it used to be there's some there was a little more support in uh in this country and i feel like uh you know if you if you stumble just for a second now you know, you, you can you can just as easily wind up on the streets. You know, you you one one good bout of depression, stumbling into some alcoholism, hmm. and you know, job loss, job loss, and then there goes your house, and then you're like, what the fuck happened? What happened? You that, know, that quick. Yeah. 
Yeah, it can it can happen to anybody, man. It really can. It's uh, it's it's scary, man. And no one gives a fuck. That's the worst part. Well, <laughs> that that's true. Yeah. I always, you know, I, I look at that and I go, um, that'll never happen to me. You know, I'll do whatever it takes, you know. Yeah. Whenever the chips are down, in my, that I, I've been through some things in my life where, you know, uh, things weren't so rosy, you know, and I was that close to, to living in a car and, you know, next thing you know, I'm, you know, hustling, man, getting my hustle on. It, just to just to pull the plane back up to get altitude again, you know, and uh I just, uh, just some people let it happen to themselves, you know, some people go down fighting, you know, to get out of that situation and still end up there. Um, and of course, like you said, depression and, and mental, um, mental issues, you know, that's a big thing. Oh yeah. Worst thing to see is a person walking up the, down the street with obvious mental issues and, you know, walking around with a blanket, you know, around their shoulders and they're barefoot, you know? Yeah. I, had, I saw this guy walking down, <clears throat> what was it, Fort Apache and Flamingo, and he was wearing a pair of, of uh, sweatpants, shorts, no shirt, no shoes, you know, and, um, and uh, he, he just laid down on the sidewalk, and I turned around, and I pulled over, and I'm like, hey, man, you know, are you okay? And um, I go, here, man, I got a, a banana in, in a bottle of water, you know? He yeah. Goes, he goes, you got, you got five bucks? I go, yeah. Here, he goes, I need some shoes, you know? I go, all right, hold on. <clears throat> I'll be right back. That was a um, Goodwill right up the street. Yeah. And I, I ran over there, and I found him some shoes. I found him some sweats. I found him a, a, a shirt. Um um, a zip up hoodie. I mean, I, <laughs> and, <Bro. clears throat> and I pulled back in to, to give it to him. And as I was pulling things out of the bag for him, he was throwing them on. Yeah. You know, I, I put the, I put the, um, uh, shoes down. He threw them on. I put the pants down. He threw them on. I put the shirt on. He threw it on, put the jacket, threw it on. He jumped up and walked away. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, God bless you, man. And I was like, uh, uh, okay. You know, you're a fucking saint, bro. The people we need people like that in this world, man. More people like that, and I bet it felt damn good too, you know. Of course, you know when you're. I had a tear in my eye, you know. Like yeah, I did, I did something really wonderful for somebody who, who needed it. You know, I, you know, I always said if I was a millionaire, I would share it, you know, to, to people less fortunate, you know. Yeah. When I go to bed every night, I pray that the last thing I say in my prayer is, you know, God please look over the less fortunate, you know, the, the children that are going to bed hungry, the wives that are getting beat up, you know, the, the people strung out on drugs, the people with mental issues, you know, the people that are fearing, you know, what's next, you know, I got it pretty good, <clears throat> you know, compared oh, yeah. to a lot of people and, you know, it'd be selfish just to pray for myself, you know? <laughs> oh, no, exactly, man. When we do, um, when we sit at the at the monastery, man, you know, it's, um, we we do four vows and everything, and one of them is, uh, you know, you, you vow to become enlightened for the sake of all living beings. And has nothing, you're not there to, like, benefit yourself or, oh. you know, for, like, you know, self-improvement. There is no self, right? It's like... I'm I'm here doing this work so that I can I can make the world a better place and and you know through me through me growing and being able to take this out into the world and like help people with it as much as humanly possible. That beams out it, that yeah. beams out positive positive energy into the world. Yeah. And love and love is the biggest uh, powerful energy there is. Yeah. You got to tell me, bro. I fucking uh, I'm a lunatic about the love thing, man. That's that's really all there. That's really the only thing you're here to do, man. That's what everything is essentially made from is is the essence of loving awareness. And uh and yeah, you want to you want to just emanate that out to everybody, man. It's like it's like whenever you uh you you take too much fucking ecstasy, you know, and you're just you fill up, you fill up, and you're just so full of love. Uh, and what do you do with it when you get to that place where you're, you know, you don't, 
you give it away to everybody. You're just walking around just fucking emanating, just pouring love out of yourself. Wow. Just like, you know, I love you so much, and you're hugging everybody, and, and just, you do anything for they anyone, They should give man. that out. They should <laughs> pat, hand that out to everybody, man, you yeah. know? Yeah. Well, you know, and you can, you can practice that in your own life. You can get to that, that place where, you know, through, you know, mindfulness and meditation and, and healthy living and just like, you know, generating, generating as much love as you can within yourself until it just fucking spills over out into the world, you know? And I think that's really like the, the true purpose in, in, in this game of life we're playing is to, to come to that realization and that practice to where you're just, you, you've, you've got so much that you just can't help but just give it away to everybody. Yeah, I mean, walking around with love in your heart, positive energy, <clears throat> and and not just holding it in, but emitting it out to the world. Yeah, you know, you're in a, you're in traffic and somebody cuts you off. You know, you can get mad or you can just go go for it, man. You know, I'm. I'm, I'm letting you in, you know, I want to let you in. Yeah. And instead of a, uh, you motherfucker, you know, yeah. you're all, I love you, man. I love you. You know, <laughs> that's the secret. That's the fucking secret right there, man. Right? You know, and compassion like that, that poor son of a bitch, you know, he's, who knows what he's going through right now, but you know, he clearly he's, he's dealing with something if he's acting like that. And it's just like, you got to just feel for the, you know, even though he's being a dick to you, it's like. You know, no, no, no. It's not about me. You right, know, and that's, right. this has nothing to do with me. This is that guy's fucking problem. And I just, you know, I just have compassion for whatever his plight is at that moment in life. Even if it's just that he doesn't realize what an asshole he is. <laughs> you know, some people get caught up in themselves so much and then it turns into their own personal hell and they just run around not understanding and, why they're suffering so much. Yeah. And seemingly, you know, stepping on others to, yeah. to do it, you know. And uh, so one thing I learned um, through through a, through a clarity program I went through was to, uh, you know, ask yourself several questions in the morning. You know, what um, what's different? What went right? What went wrong? Um, what am I grateful for? And what do I want to create today? Yeah. And so that practice took me away from you know, the fast lane and zipping in and out of lanes to getting in the slow lane where it's slower but less aggressive and then just putting some good music on and meditating on the way to work and not have... I feel sorry for those people that are just racing because they're just dying to get to work. Yeah. By dying, I mean they could die. The yeah. Way, the way they're driving, you know, and and and... Check my pulse compared yeah. to their pulse. Well, my that, pulse is boom, boom, and there's like, boom, 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 yeah. you know, they're stressing. The stress kills you, right? Yeah. Not just collisions, but stress in your life. And they should get rid of time clocks, man, because that, that, that push to get someplace at a certain time to clock in or, you know, you can get fired or whatever. You can lose your livelihood. Yeah. I think that's in, in, inhumane. Yeah. I haven't went by a time clock in the past 10 years. I mean, my start time might be 7 a.m., but if I get there at 7, 10, I'm, I'm here, you know? Yeah. I'll work that 10 minutes over. It doesn't matter when you get there. It matters you get you there safely, and it matters that you get there in tune with what you want to create that day instead of you're not thinking about any of that and you're just trying to beat lights and cut people off to get ahead and uh, it's it's sickening man yeah. plus you just threw away 30 minutes of your existence on yeah, that trip of enjoyment you're not being in the present moment and the only thing you should ever be focused on is being in the present moment if you're if you are present it doesn't matter what you're doing you know you're you, wrapping cables washing dishes cleaning fucking toilets doesn't matter driving to work if you're present if you're right here right now mm -hmm. then everything's fine mm -hmm. everything is fine man you know there's nothing to actually be worried about you know like you know you might be concerned with some something that's going to happen at work you know when you get there or some issue that you're having at home but it's like hey you're not at work right now and you are not at home right now you're in the fucking car right just be in the car just be driving. 
You sing the song that's on the radio. Don't be concerned with how getting there 30 seconds earlier, you know, because right. you're going to get there when you're going to get there, man. I, here's here's another little thing I, I always would do to keep myself calm. Yeah. And I've done this for years. So this was ahead of the clarity class <clears throat> was um, I'm looking at the clock in my car and and I got five minutes to get there. But what I tell myself is, am I late right now? No, I'm not late right now. In five minutes, I will be. You know, <laughs> where will I be in five minutes? I won't be here. I'll be over there and closer. But the thing is, it's you, you're stressing before you're even late. Yeah, yeah. You're only late when you're late. Yeah. When that clock strikes midnight, that's officially the time where you're late. So it, it was, it's, oh, it was always a stress reliever to me. Like, oh, uh, 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 man, five minutes. Okay, am I late yet? No. Okay, calm down. You know, just kind of reel myself in. Yeah. And, uh, God, there's so many ways to, you know, keep yourself in, in tune. And, and, and uh, like you said, right he, be right here. Another thing is to ask yourself, what am I thinking right now? If you're ever monkey mining... Yeah, man. You know, thinking about all these other things and stressing, just ask yourself, what am I what am I thinking right now? And once you do that, you're thinking about where you're at right now. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's a little a little tool to um pull yourself out of um stressing about what happened in the past or what's going to happen in the future and keep you present because when you're present, you know, you got to look at Am I safe? Am I gonna die? You know, the people people react of of jealousy, anger, um, um, all the the seven sins. Yeah. Based are all based on fear. Yeah. Okay. I'm a, I'm afraid somebody's gonna take something from me. I'm a, I'm afraid somebody's gonna hurt me. I'm afraid um, somebody's gonna cheat on me. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. And and then you your body. And if you if you ask your body how it feels if it's tense, it that tells you something, right? Yeah. It tells you you're not in a good place. So what you could do is change your thinking to think about a puppy, you know, <laughs> about your little beautiful puppy outside, how soft, and all of a sudden those those tensions just kind of subside, you know, and and uh, you you become in the present. And I don't know, there's. I, I've been studying a lot about stuff like that, uh, the positive results, of, uh, amazing results of positive thinking by Norman Vincent Peale, um, The Secret. I've, I've got that on, on disc in my car. Yeah. Or riding to work, it just gets me focused and in tune, manifesting what I want out of life. I mean, The Secret's... Everything, everything that exists right now came out of someone's thought process you had to think about it first yeah it didn't just it didn't just appear someone thought about it then they put effort in and then they created it and it's like so literally everything that it, that exists comes out of your thought processes man i had a really great experience uh um for about nine months i drove uber oh interesting i met people from 27 different countries i you know i met thousands of people <clears throat> and this one guy I met he was going to work his transmission blew up and his girlfriend broke up with him and and I could just tell he was just a ball of you know stress and I and I said hey man I go you might not realize this right now but <clears throat> right now that's all you could think about I go in six months from now those will those will just be a watershed moment, you know. But right now it's a it's it's Mount Rushmore. Yeah. You know? It's uh it's 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 gigantic. It's the stress of your life. But if you could actually think like, hey, you know, maybe I'm just being challenged. You know, maybe God's challenging me. Maybe the universe is just challenging me, throwing me a little, you know, a screwball. You know, yeah. and seeing how I react. Do I rise to the occasion? Do I stress about it or do I meditate and pray? Do I, you know, rise to the occasion and, and, but by the time I dropped him off, he was really calm. You know, I, I was happy to help him 
kind of uh, feed his mind with the uh, like, hey, this is this is all be over, you know, and that's part of fear, you know. We we have fear about anything that pops up, man. You know, somebody who's family member who's dying. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you're going to be you know stressed out about that, but you know, in six months from now, a year from now, you know that pain that that sadness you know it's it starts to fade you know a breakup you know yeah. we all get over it you know and these are all these are all the the moments in our lives that are the things that develop our character you know this is these are all the the the, the experiences that we come here um that that make us you know really who we are and and, and create this this karmic pathway that um, that our life is kind of, you know, made out of, uh, and it's, it's really the, uh, the purpose of coming here in the first place is you, like, you can't just, it can't all just be, you know, sunshine and puppy dogs, man. Mm-hmm. You, and, and nor would that be interesting. I mean, if you, if you woke up every single day and nothing ever went wrong, <laughs> you didn't have to go to work. They're just, you know, you just hang out and, 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 just play with puppies all day long, you know? And every hand was a seven, yeah, you know? Some gorgeous woman will come just give you a blow job whenever you want. Ooh. You don't have to you don't have to work for it. How long would you be able to do that for? Before you just like blow your cutting brain your up. own <laughs> cutting the you know, your arm just to feel pain, to feel something, you know? Like uh. smashing things just to create anarchy so that you feel alive a little bit. You know, like it it it, it the it's it's when we create that positive negative aspect on these moments in our lives to where you know if it's if it's like an unappealing thing then it's a negative thing it's 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 not so much so that that's that you're unfortunate it's, it's fucked up what I'm about to say but anyways uh, you know like your a family member dying is negative you know but a family member getting married is positive mm. it's it's these are both major life events which create the character that you're playing and create the karmic circumstances of your life and putting the positive negative labels on them uh, and attaching uh, to one and, and pushing the other away is like the root cause of all your suffering, you know, Uh, and it's, it's what's making it so hard to go through all of that as opposed to just allowing it to be and embracing it all for what it is you know life life and birth yeah it's like we schindler's list is an amazing movie right <clears throat> and we we don't put that movie on because it's going to make us laugh you or, know or, or be happy <laughs> it's brutal yeah it's fucking brutal <clears throat> and um <clears throat> but it's it's this thing that happens and it's very interesting and it's very emotional and it's very um impactful you know and i and i and i think trying to run away from those moments in our lives or um or push away those moments in our lives that are that are so deeply impactful in such a way that we would consider negative in this dualistic manner um you know that really just it's the reason that we suffer from them in the first place is because we're pushing them away, you know, mm. because we're saying this is a bad thing. This, this shouldn't be happening. Instead of just accepting and, you know, compartmentizing it and and <clears throat> moving on, living through it, you know. Yeah, <laughs> embracing it. I went through a list of people I know who passed away <clears throat> uh, a day or two ago, and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> You it's know, a big list. It it's getting bigger every year. You know, as and I it was so weird because I was uh <clears throat> I was in prayer and I just started naming off this person, that person, this person, this person, all the way down to you know when I was fifteen, sixteen, and some you know people my age at the time you know passed away. I, I, like I remember all all their names. You know, of course, and um. It, it was powerful, um, and it, and it's <clears throat> even more powerful to know that I I never forgot them or their names. I forget people's names a lot, <laughs> 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 but the impact of their passing obviously you know uh, stayed with me. So, and I, from 
what I was told as a kid or whatever, and I, I believe today that whenever you think about somebody who's passed on, they automatically come into present, you know? Yeah. And, you know, to talk to grandma, you know? Yeah. And she's probably going, man, it's been three years since you talked to me, motherfucker. <laughs> well, and you know, that, that, that reality exists within you, man. It's, it's like, a, you know, um, a stupid example of this is, is me cutting my hair and my beard off and everything. And um, everybody, uh, you know, if, if they had thought about me, they would think about me in such a manner that I had this long hair, the beard, I'm smoking fucking pot, you know, and like, <laughs> uh, you know, and this is this, this, um, objectification of my persona, you know? And so that's a character that you bring to life every time you think about me. Right. Mm. But it's not who I am at that very moment because you can never know that. Right. And, um, but that's still this character that exists and it, it, it's very much real. It's just as real as you or I that, um, you know, you're, you're bringing to life. So when you re, when you are remembering, you know, your, your fallen, uh, friends and family, um, it's, you're, you're revitalizing this, this character role, this image, this memory. of Yeah. Them. It's funny you say that because, uh, <clears throat> I had a guitar player or sorry, I had a guitar tech, I was like shit, nineteen, twenty years old, and um, this this kid Memo, little little Mexican dude with Bon Jovi hair, <clears throat> yeah. curly, wild, beautiful fucking hair, you know. He he ended up dying. He fell off the back of a truck on a on a freeway. Jesus. And um, anyhow, um, went to his funeral, and his head was shaved. And I didn't recognize him, you yeah. know. And anyhow, subsequently after that me and the band and a bunch of other people got together and did a, a car wash, you know? And uh, we had chicks out there in bikinis and it was a wild, wild, wild car wash, let's just say. Um, but anyhow, we bought, a, bought, we got enough money to buy him a headstone and, uh, and, um, and with his face carved on it, you know? Yeah. But we didn't do the short hair. No. You know, we did the, the, the memo we all knew, you know? And I thought that was cool. Yeah, that character... That meant so much to you in your heart. I have, yeah. I, I got a bad thought. Like if I ever died of cancer, you know, after a five year battle, and you know, tubes all in and out of me, and my hair's gone, I don't want people to remember me that way. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, man. I want them to to remember me. You know, with long crazy hair, tattoos. You know, up on stage, uh, rocking out, having fun. You know. Yeah, it's like uh, Norm Macdonald, man. You know, he didn't tell anybody that he was dying of cancer and he didn't let anybody know that that was going on. And he, there was just there's just no moment in anybody's um, memory of Norm as Norm who's dying of cancer. There's just the guy who made everyone fucking laugh. And he was and he was, you know, he's still just cracking up rooms. Well, he's sitting there fucking dying. Nobody knows what's going on, too. And nobody could tell. Wow. He did not give a shit. And I just thought that was one of the most beautiful things I ever heard, man. Well, and what a way to go. I got to tell you, I've always, you know, contemplated that myself, that if that ever happened to me, you know, I'm not going to make it public and have everybody feel sorry for me. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll do it, you know, on my own. And when it's, when it's, when it happens, you know. Everybody will know at that point, you know, not, <laughs> not to try to be some badass or nothing, just, yeah. I just uh, something I thought about, you know, and and I and I and I don't want to be buried. I want to be cremated and planted under a tree, you know, to give that life, you know, to live through that tree, you know, to continue on. Yeah, you know, and hey, maybe I'll be somebody's uh, log fire someday, you know. <laughs> it, you know, the the nature of reality is impermanence, man. It's always just in flux. And really, I mean, these things that we're carrying around, these, these corpses that we're embodying, you know, it's just, it's just topsoil. It's just, it's just dirt, you know, the, the dirt, the dirt gives birth to the, the seed and the seed fruits and, you know, 
we eat the fruit and the fruit turns into our, our cells and their cells collect together into this <clears throat> pattern that we call you our just, body. You just made me think, yeah. Yeah, and then it just, you know, it, it lasts for, the pattern's constantly, dis it's just, it's disintegrating. As we speak right now in this room, cells are dying and <sighs> falling away from me. It's just, it's just pouring off of me, man. You know, and it's just, it's the most impermanent thing in the world dude and our bodies it, replace itself yeah. completely with with within like seven years yeah and, and our skin cells are replaced like um on a weekly or monthly basis like we gen lose and generate new yeah, skin cells rapidly all day long all day long we're doing <clears throat> that man so that being said like, uh, let me look it up that being said if you have cancer and you use positive energy over the duration of your cancer, you can turn that cancer into, uh, you can turn it into death. You know what I mean? Not, not your death, but you could kill the cancer by, oh, yeah. by regenerating new um, body parts over, you know, seven years. <clears throat> and on a back note, you said, uh, you know, the seed creates the, 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 the fruit and we eat the fruit. You got me thinking, I, I, I want to be buried under a fruit tree. There you go. So people literally will eat me, <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. What kind of fruit would you like to be? Uh, mango. Mango. Yeah. And mangoes are delicious. And they're, it's, it's a fascinating tree, man, the way that it grows and how long it takes before it starts to, to actually give back fruit. And then you just like, want to get buried. Oh. You just got to want You just want to get buried in Costa Rica. <laughs> right. India, bro. India, I, uh, man. Ben, Benares, dude. Like, like for me, uh, the, the, uh, I, I'm trying to, I don't know if it'll happen. I don't care if it does or doesn't because, uh, you know, this is something that I'm doing for infinity, this whole concept consciousness thing and like in, you know incarnating into different awarenesses and different forms but uh but supposedly supposedly yeah. if you can make your way to Benares on in India and be um be uh, incinerated at the burning gods it's like a cheat code to um to not be incarnated again and to like your Atman can merge back with Brahman and and, and merge back into the one and uh, the game over, man. You know. Uh oh, no, are you no afraid to be bombing. recreated again, or? No, it's just the game we're playing. Oh. It's just the game we're playing. I'm, I, I, I subscribe to um, the um, the Hindu version of reality, uh, which is um, life's drama, and uh, time is cyclical, and um, consciousness is just a thing. There's no such thing as as. Uh, and and philo philosophically, right? There's no such thing as non-existence. There just can't. There's not a thing as nothing, right? Like, um, for anything to be experienced, there has to be a subject-object relationship of like, the, you know, some form of awareness observing some type of object or event occurring, right? So there's no such thing as that not happening, right? Right. So. Um, Anyways, this just this is a it's just a fluctuation. Oh, it's like a it's like a um, a pulse that happens where um, all of awareness is one thing or Brahman, right? And I and I'm I'm not a fucking scholar in all this. I'm sure I'm fucking this all up. But uh, you know everything is Brahman, and it's just God, the Godhead, and it's one thing, and it's it's infinitely unlimited and can do anything it wants, and it's aware that it's God, and uh, and then. Um, since it can do anything it wants and it ultimately will do everything, uh, because time is, is time is just something that exists in our version of three dimensional space, right? It's this, this is this, we live in, we live in, uh, 3d space and time, uh, time's just, it's not really, it's a, it's a construct of our existence, not of like overall awareness and existence. And so throughout infinity, it's going to do everything, including, uh, separate into infinite consciousnesses called Atman, which it's doing right now, and living out infinite lifespans, lifetimes, all possibilities at once. And it just goes, let's, uh, let's forget I'm God for a little while. And it bursts open into everything that exists, and it's everything. And then we live out this drama for ever. Because time is 
<laughs> long. Time's not real, man. Uh, Kalpas. They, they, they could call it Kalpas. Um, and so, um, or uh, they call it yugas, and yugas are made up of kalpas. Uh, kalpas, 4,320,000 uh, years. And right now we're in what is considered the Kali Yuga, which is the worst of all yugas, the yuga Uh-oh. of corruption. Um, so, but it's all just a drama. It's a thing that's just being played out that um, just goes on and on forever. And then so eventually we all revert back in. We all karmically purify ourselves because... Um, and this is just my perception of the whole thing, which is like the Brahman, the Godhead, the center of it all. Like, uh, I imagine a sphere and everything emanating out from the sphere, but it's much more, <laughs> it's higher dimensional than that. You know, I just, my brain only works on three dimensions cause I have a three dimensional brain. But, uh, um, you know, that's, that's this purity, this pure loving awareness. That's just, there's nothing there. There's nothing there, but compassion and love and uh you know all of your fears and like um you know suffering and your desires and your perversions and all this shit this is part of your physical self right this is part of the ego structure that the physical body is wrapped up in and your awareness is uh, occupying that space and so it's like it's like this merging of this love and compassion with the physical self and all your survival mechanisms but like behind all that it, there's just there's just this loving awareness. So when we purify and purify and purify ourselves away, which is like what the spiritual practice is, whatever spiritual practice you might want to call it, you know, if you want to follow Jesus, you know, he's teaching the same thing as the gurus in India or the Buddha. Um, you know, it's all, it's, they're all, they're all leading you up the mountain, man. Purify yourself, love everyone, <clears throat> compassion for everything, you know, and you, you get to this point where, um, you karmically have nothing left to do to purify your awareness and you merge back into Brahman and everything's doing this. Everything's doing this constantly. So we, it like explodes out into infinity and then slowly, um, you know, and entropy, you know, like with the farthest ends of it, the little tiny curly cue of pain at the end of a big paint blotch. That's mm. us. That's just our whole universe, mm. you know, and like fucking infinities, like, mm. you know, infinity, man. And it slowly peeled itself back as it purifies. And then it becomes Godhead again. And it's all knowing, unlimited, infinite in knowledge Whoa. and possibility. And I know that's a mouthful. It's hard to get all out, but it's this beautiful concept of reality. And, um, and for me, it's the, it makes the most sense. And when I drop fucking mega doses of acid, um, that's exactly what reality feels like. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And so I just recognize that all things are love, that compassion isn't something that you can develop, you know, you can't work on it. You just, once you pour all this bullshit away from yourself, that's what you are. It's your true nature is just love. You know, when it's that voice inside of your head, it's a baby, you know, a fucking, a baby, you know, a baby's nothing but love. It doesn't know anything. Uh. This is no shit, man. It just fucking reaches out and just loves everything. Yeah. And slowly we turn that baby into a person and we build this ego around it, you know? And then, you know, you're fucking Jason and this is the things you like and this is how I want you to fucking act and this is how you behave and you don't do this and you do do this right. and you slowly turn into this thing, you know? And then you're like, I like this stuff, but I don't like this stuff and it just turns into the shell. But before all that happened to you, you were just love mm. and compassion and you're just, wow. Wow. And that's your true nature, man. That's what you really are underneath all of it. And when you can get rid of this <clears throat> facade of self, um, you know, all that's left is love and compassion. It's like just stripping down to your, your you know, what you were born with, you know? Yeah. Completely naked, you know, stripped away from from all, anything that, it, that that's concerning, you know? I. I always, I always thought it was uh, a soci- so sociology, um, uh, psychology, psychology thing, whatever that just tripped me out. My mom's a psychologist, by the way. I'd love to talk to her. Oh, she's fascinating. <laughs> but think, you know, it blows my mind when you, when I see thugs, you yeah. know, like, talk like this, you know, and, and I always tell people like. What do you think he was when he was like when he was like three years old? Do you think yeah. he talked like that? 
Do you well, think he had his pants hanging off his ass, you know, on purpose? Yeah. You know, that it's just the, the people become personas, like you said. Yeah, it's a character know? role. And and also think it's a character role, but it's also a, a sociology thing because it's who they surround themselves around, right? Yeah. Now go to the airport and watch a bunch of dudes get off from uh, um, Europe, man. They're all wearing they're all wearing the same little loafer shoes, the little <laughs> little uh, tight long uh, short pants, the, you know the polo shirt. I mean, it's funny. Or you see these guys all wearing pointy toe shoes. They're all together wearing yeah. pointy toe shoes. It's like, man, do they dress each other? I've seen guys in the mall where they both had baseball caps on backwards. They both had goatees. They both, you know, were wearing the same thing. They, they, it's like they dress each other. And yeah. that's, you know, we're, we're kind of taught, drawn towards, you know, our, our surroundings, right? Yeah, and, and we, we, emulate, we emulate things around us. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of unoriginality in this world. Oh, yeah, no. So you, you come into this place as this pure, pure loving awareness, man. And then, um, you know, your parents who, um, at this point, very much convinced that they're real. You know, they're convinced that they are who everybody tells them they are, which is the role that you play. Like me being Jason, right? Like, I don't believe I'm Jason, right? I play the role real well, <laughs> all right? And I, but I'm not caught up in being Jason, you know, and then I don't associate with that as like um, my core identity, you know, because um, there is no such thing as Jason. And all these these um, habits that I've developed over the years, which I'm kind of trapped in, right? I'm locked in all this habit energy and um, this illusion of self and ego um, and all my desires and aversions that I just kind of collected uh, over the years, right? This is this is a prison. It's a, it's a soul prison, you know, or a prison of thought. And, um, and so I, I recognize it as such. And then uh, my, my goal throughout the day is to breathe, <sighs> be present and love everyone around me as much as I fucking can, because I'm not real. Neither are they, but they think they are and they suffer immensely because of it. And this is what Jesus was talking about, man. You know, it's just that compassion for your fellow man. And the whole reason he let them put him up on that fucking cross, you know, to prove to them, like, man, this body isn't me. Mm. This doesn't make a difference, you know. Heaven's within you. It's not a place you go, mm. you know. It's, it's, it's a state of mind. It's, it's a recognizing that you're complete at this very moment. You always have been. And the only thing getting in the way of that is the fact that you think you're real and that there's somewhere to go, that there's something to attain, that your desires need to be fulfilled. And that's all a trap, man. It's called the illusion of Maya. And, um, and when you can get away from that, man, you just, the world opens up to you and it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing, man. And you're literally right now, you're, you are sitting in heaven because this is infinity. Like I was saying before, you're going to do this forever. Conscious experience one way or another incarnation after incarnation, this body's going to die and the Atman or the collection of awareness that's occupying is going to uh, occupy a different kind of awareness. And that's going to just keep fucking happening forever, you know? And it doesn't have to be in this specific three-dimensional reality either, you know, like this version of Earth or this timeline or this uh, multiverse, whatever you want to fucking call it, you know what I mean? So, like, literally everything is only relatively real. And so where we're sitting right now being eternity would by definition be heaven if uh -huh. you just accept it because there's nowhere else to go man <laughs> and everything's perfect by the way yeah what do you need in the world food and water and water falls from the sky and, and food, food grows out of the ground yeah those are the only th two things you fucking need man and god made them so plentiful water falls from the sky wow. and food grows out of the ground 
It's all the other extra bullshit that we get wrapped up in that makes heaven a hell. And we make a hell of ourselves. And it's a fucking trap, man. Wow. And it's because we think we're real and that our desires need to be fulfilled all the time. And they fucking don't. You can just sit here and be. There's nothing you need to do. And if you can learn to do that, man, you, you will... You, you can't believe how fucking content you'll be in your life. Wow. And that's all I, that's my only goal. I don't care about fucking money. I don't care about fame. Yeah. I don't care about if anybody ever sees any of my art or hears any song I ever write. I just follow my breath and I'm grateful for having it. And that's all there is to do. And uh, I wish I could give that to everybody. I wish I could show everybody that. You can't. You fucking can't, man. And if you are not trying to, <laughs> you'll lose all your friends. <laughs> um, you know. But it's all the only thing. It's the only thing. And it's magnificent. And I and I know that I've gone crazy. And I'm a and I'm literally a crazy Jesus freak. And uh or whatever, you know, Buddha freak, you know, Rama, Sp Krishna. Spiritual. You know, yeah, spiritual nut job. Um, but try it, you know, try it. It's very interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. I, you know, I love the, the, the fact that you're such a deep thinker. Probably one of the deepest thinkers I've ever met, to be honest with you, you know. Thank you. And um, I appreciate that, you know. I, the way you described everything was is very... Uh, elegant it was it, it, it it's hard to wrap the brain around it yeah this isn't logical but, thought i'm talking about here and that's it's kind of like um the matrix you know where things bend and shift and and you, you don't understand why but there's reasoning you know and and you had you're the you're the one person i know that uh has sought out those those answers you know and you have to kind of like just take a picture of the world and erase it yeah and and to and, and redraw it in a way that nobody would recognize it you know? yeah and know that it's constantly being erased every second is being erased that's the other thing linear time and the illusion of linear time man right interdependent origination it's a buddhist concept which means this moment right now sprung from nothing and I, I know there's this whole feeling of the moment before where we were talking and taking pictures and the moment before that where you were walking through my front door and the moment before that where you were riding moment. your motorcycle over there. And each of these moments interdependently originate, you know. It's, it feels Inter like a string of events. It's like a... Um it's like a picture, 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 yeah. and now, now, now run them together fast. Yeah, and so it's a moment, a moment, a moment. But if you run them together fast, it be, creates a, a moving picture. Yeah, and the, the illusion, and just like a movie is a series of still images that, when run together at a specific pace, creates the illusion of life or the illusion of functioning like a movement, right? And time. The same thing with interdependent origination. That's what's happening to us now. And it's just creating the illusion of this linear time structure. But there's only this moment. It's like right now? Right now. What about right now? Exactly. How about now? Yep. Now? It's the only thing that's ever been. Now? Yes. When does it start and when does it stop? Now. Right now? Yeah. It just stopped. Right now. And now it started. Yes. No, it didn't start. It just, another moment started. Yeah. Not, it didn't start. Another moment happened. Is. Another moment is. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so wild. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, you know, and it's, if you, you, you can, you can be materialistic and, and, and atheistic about this stuff and just go, uh, you know, and worship science because that's that's a whole different religion as far as I'm concerned is the, the whole the, the science principle that that's the only truth you know and it's just another truth it's because well, it's the they can't measure it you know yeah they, well, they can't put it in a test tube and go under a microscope no look at there you know because it's it's like you said time is I think Einstein said time is 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 um, things that are, that are hap that are going to happen 
in in the future are already happening. Yeah, it's all happens at once. So and the past affects the future and the future affects the past and, and the present is just what we're experiencing of that fluctuation. You could be on a Harley right now in the future. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, boom, you're riding on a Harley, you know, but in the future. Yeah. And it, it, it could be. Well, and you will be, Brian. I will be. You will be. I you're going to have this experience on your way home. All of a sudden, you're going to be present on your Harley and go, oh, fuck. Here I am right now. Boom. On my Harley. It's, it just happened. That happens a lot. Yeah. It I got to pinch lot. myself. I'm like, oh, my God. This yeah. is so fun. Yeah, and if you come to if you come at reality and see these are these are just thought these are these are games you get to play with your consciousness and when you come at reality from these different places, man, and and play this game of 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 conscious thought and awareness, it just it opens the world up in such beautiful ways, man, and such beautiful perceptions because all we have is our perception, you know what I mean? That's your perception creates reality, right? It's 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 true. Man, like, cause when I was super depressed, everything was horrible. Everybody fucking sucked. You know, I wanted to kill myself because it was just unbearable to exist in such a piece of shit world where everybody's so fucking horrible to each other. Nobody cares. Everyone's throwing all their garbage on the street and fucking raping kids and fucking killing each other. And it's just too much. It's overwhelming suffering and your perception of reality can be as such that that's all you perceive and that's not untrue right those are those are things that are happening and but my perception of it and where my focus come is and where my awareness your attention. stands where it comes from you know and how that that perception of everything when you shift that the world shifts with it the world shifts I, with it i see i see uh posts of people with cancer people dying and i i don't subscribe to it i yeah. i i see it i move on i don't manifest myself into that you know and it's not because i'm, I'm heartless it's because I just, I want to be in a, in a good positive place, you know, Yeah. as much as I can, you know, and, um, something that I've been working on in meditation is just, uh, taking, you know, the monkey mind of stress and, uh, fears and, and turning it into something that benefits me more. You know, yeah. hearing about somebody's mom in the hospital, um, though, you know, I feel sad. I just don't want to um, uh, lock myself into it. They, here's, here's, a, here's an example. Um, I, I went to visit somebody who was had some major um, surgeries coming, some infections, current infections, and went there to you know to bring happiness into the room you know to bring a positive hey how are you man brought you something you know <clears throat> and the the person all they wanted to talk about was you know their 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 agony their angst their, yeah. their things that they're going through the suffering and and uh, you know when when you wrap your brain around what they're going through you, you're taking some of that with you oh yeah you know and you know it's not to be heartless but you're better off extracting yourself from that instead of burying yourself in that whole you know that that sadness and that uh, <clears throat> that suffering you know yeah and that's a hard place to be man and it's one of the things that i've actually started researching is uh volunteering at hospice centers um Ooh. and uh it's just um it's part of it a a part of where my practice is leading me and and b part of just the the overwhelming love that i was talking about where uh when i have my days off man 
like I feel like I'm I can should be giving back uh, as opposed to like uh, recreating so much and still I, like I love going and riding my bike and going for hikes and shit like that but uh, you know I, I'm at a place in my life now where it's like you know I should be going to do this thing and uh, and choosing the hospice is, is part of the practice is is learning to deal with these moments of death and being a, in a place where you can be this open um, source of love for these people uh, when they're ready to stop suffering for a moment and be there with them uh, and be strong enough to be there with them because that's a very fucking brutal place to be uh, in, a pl- in a building full of everyone dying uh, but it's it's reality man it's reality it's it's most true you know which is like this is such an impermanent fixture uh this is this 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 physical body that we're we're in and 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 the more you can let go of it uh the more you can be willing to leave it voluntarily you know the better off you'll be throughout your life because attachment to the to the physical self um, you know that's like the ultimate form of suffering and uh and yeah, it's, uh, I don't but know. I don't, I don't know what that adventure is going to lead to. You can, but you can change the trajectory of <clears throat> of where you're going physically, health wise. Yeah. By by being positive. Well, yeah. Watching it's, funny movies, uh, sitcoms, laughing. You know, saying this cancer's going, it's, it's disappearing, it's, it's leaving my body, it's leaving my body, and you believe it, and you're thankful that it's, it's going away. It's yeah. going away, and I'm going to think, I'm going to laugh, I'm going to smile. It's a lot better than the alternative where you're just, you know, you think, I'm, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. And you just, you, uh, obviously, it, you're just going to, you know, make it happen faster. Uh, make it more painful, probably. I don't know, but yeah. Well, you're an energy I, being. Yeah. I, all I know is, if I ever, you know, got cancer, I talk about that a lot. <laughs> um, probably because my brother-in-law just died on the 22nd uh, August. Bro, lung cancer. Fought it for two and a half years. Um, never smoked a cigarette in his life. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, um, those are the people that. <laughs> Those are the people that always fucking get lung cancer too, right? The ones that See, never right? smoked. Secondhand smoke. Yeah. But if I, 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 I'll tell you this. If I ever got cancer in any type of way, I'll, I'll quit my job. I'll, I'll live in a tent. doesn't matter. I will give up all worldly goods. I will just go to a mountaintop and, uh, and just meditate. Yeah. And, and meditate it away, you know? Meditate it to, to disappear. Well, and there's, It'll take a lot of focus. That's why I want to go to the mountaintop. You know, I don't want to be yeah. city lights, honk, uh, horns honking. You know, I want to be very, very, very focused. There's do- a lot of documented um, cases of that, of that happening, where people like heal themselves through meditative practice and positivity, and like you know, just just go. No, I'm I'm getting better. Like I love the the. Th- thing from uh what was it like damien eccles said in a midnight gospel you know he goes uh you, you don't say um someone asks you if you're if you're sick you don't say yes you say uh i'm getting better minute by minute you know hmm. you never give it that power you, you always, never accept it yeah you, you know, always just... you always you know remain positive and and, and never s- succumb to like the the um, was it the giving up, you know, surrendering to the yeah. inevitability of death is like a negative thing. You can always, you can always create this positive energy and energy. It cycles, man. And you can, you can get that shit cycling within yourself and it'll, it'll heal, man. Well, like I was saying that <clears throat> from what I've, I've learned is that our bodies regenerate a hundred percent in a matter of seven years time. Yeah. So if we're, redeveloping organs and skin cells and bone cells and you know hair and everything else you know if we if we eat right yeah if we exercise right if we sleep right we drink enough water we're going to be healthier humans as opposed to going through fast food all day every day right so oh yeah so think of it this way um changing yourself into a um uh, spiritual being where meditation 
uh, takes over stresses and fears um, is like switching from a Big Mac to carrots. Yeah. Okay. It's like, this is going to kill you. This is going to give you longevity. This is going to kill you being where you're, you're stressed and you're not, you know, you're worried and your fears as opposed to being somebody who's enlightened and uh, accepts whatever's to be, but also has the spiritual power to, over time, as cells die off and new cells come in, just like the cheeseburger, you know, we have cells that are dying off and coming back and because you're eating cheeseburgers and cheeseburgers and, you know, they're going to just keep getting worse, gener- degenerate and degenerate and degenerate as opposed to eating, you know, broccoli, kale, carrots, tomatoes, apples, um, bananas, papaya, um, <laughs> and so forth and so on, you know, things that are grown from the fruit with uh, have no saturated fats, no, you know, no um, disease. Yeah. And that will that 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 will gener- regenerate your body if you eat that just that you're regenerating good cells yeah. if you're eating just this these cheeseburgers and big macs then you're just regenerating the same cells and just waiting for the cancer cell to pop up and explode you know so mental you know um mentality is such a big part of of who we are as far as aging, you know, I'm 56 and there's people who go, no way, you know, and uh, I'm probably going to just say that, you know, it's because the way I live life, I don't, I don't live like a 56 year old dude, you know, yeah, I never have, you know, all my friends are in their twenties, thirties, forties, and it's, the people I surround myself with and, and, and music is such a, um, it soothes the soul. It's, it, it feeds the spirit, you know, and, and, um, the scene, the music scene as friends, supporting friends, it's such a positive thing as opposed to sports where, you know, it's you against them, yeah. you know, type thing. Uh, even that could be, you know, um, shake hands at the end of the match, you know, hey, good good job, you know, but when you're in UFC, it's to kill the other guy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but music is such a, um, a beautiful thing that it, it it's the fountain of youth, you know? I'd agree, man. Most of the musicians I know that uh, the older they get, the younger they seem, man. Like, <laughs> they just, you know, it's... It's a different energy. It's a different vibe when you're a musician, man. And like you were saying too about the 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 food and the diet and everything, man. Like once you what you put in your body is what your body ultimately becomes or it comes from. Um, literally, you are what you eat. Those cells. Yeah, and I treat my dude. I treat my diet. Uh, uh, well, a there's like a relationship that you develop with food where food isn't. Um, uh, a, a sense desire fulfillment game, right? Like you, you, like if that's the relationship you have with food, where it's just it's a thing you shove in your mouth because it and you get enjoyment good and you get um, you know temporary endorphins. satisfaction and endorphins out of it. <laughs> you have a bad relationship with food, you know. Food, drink, drink some uh, pressed kale, man. It's uh, yeah. ugh, but you feel so good after you yeah ingest such a you know awesome um nutrients you know yeah it's fuel and and the clean fuel is like super important and when you're doing the uh that process like i i for me like my my food and my diet is it's it's almost like uh getting high man you know like because my state of, of of mind and my my overall sense of like how i feel uh you know that stems from you know healthy living and and proper diet and any time that i breathe in and breathe out and I'm right here and I'm right now I've been eating good and my body feels great you know and in each of those moments where I am present and I'm aware and I take you know uh you know I check in uh everything feels phenomenal and I'm just I'm right where I need to be and it's like 
when I add, and I experiment with that kind of stuff, you know, and when I add like smoking weed to the situation, it t- tends to turn into like a negative thing, you know, anytime I'm trying to, trying to like temporarily like boost up an extra notch from what like baseline reality is where it's just like me drinking water and eating vegetables and rice and oatmeal and shit like that just like clean living you know um anytime you try to take a step above that it all to always every single time ends up being like two steps below just right afterwards you go up for a really short time and then you're down for a really long time as opposed to just being okay with being right right there at like five five to six out of ten you know if that's your aim in life um, most of the time, because you're not reaching for it, you're actually hanging out at like a seven or an eight, you know, where you're just, you, you, you you're so content with just like, all I got to do is maintain a five. You yeah. feel so fucking good and you're yeah. in such a good place that you just consequentially like start climbing and feeling like better than you ever have. You start elevating re- regardless. Yeah. And like, dude, and getting high and instant gratification it always just costs way more (laughs) than it's worth and no matter what you do what you're trying to accomplish you know what i mean like if you're just fucking if you're just gorging yourself on junk food because it tastes good you're gonna feel like shit all the time and then if you're popping pills or smoking weed or drinking booze to like cover up you well, like kind of feel like shit so i'll get fucking high and it's like now you're that it's, it's just exponential it's an exponential spiral downward and you're never gonna feel good because you're not just being you're always reaching out and trying to like you know you're trying to feel better than you than you are without earning it i think uh the alcohol thing is is something that you know, I, I've, I've dealt with where, you know, I'm, uh, am I high yet? Am I high yet? Uh, okay, okay, now I'm too high. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, and you know, I just wanted enjoyable. I just want to to enjoy myself. But, you know, if I'm if I've got to ask myself, you know, how am I feeling all the time? Then, then maybe it's just, it's pointless. And you know. Uh, it just started becoming like uh, where you know it, it you you drink and then the the next day there's a void and then to fill that void you drink again you know yeah. I, I had a best way to explain it but uh, and you ask yourself am I having fun you know and and <laughs> if you're if you're very truthful the answer is no yeah you're you know? not. I have more fun, you know, chilling out at home, watching Game of Thrones or whatever, and uh, just with like a, you know, water Gatorade, um, uh, but but sober, you know, just sober. Not, I haven't smoked weed in probably three years, you know. Yeah. Um, I used to. Um, I, I have an addictive personality, <clears throat> so once I. Um, uh, somebody, I can't mention who, but um, somebody said, "Hey, man, I uh, one of my one of my riders or, or riders um, gave me. I was dropping them off at the airport. They gave me a joint here. You know, I took that joint. And I smoked it. And <laughs> next thing I know, I was smoking weed for the, like the next year and a half. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't cheap. You know, I was probably spending fifty bucks every two days." So Jesus. $50, $100, 150 200 250 300 350 400 like you know 500 600 bucks a month. Yeah. And and when I when I wanted to buy my bike, I said, "You know what? I know how to save money." <laughs> so I, I stopped smoking weed. But um it was just it was such a, a trip to me that that happened the way it happened. Yeah. And other drugs earlier on in my life happened the same way, you know, some cocaine, okay, you know, next thing you know, I'm into cocaine, you know, I'm like, yeah. the hell? I wasn't planning on being in a coke, you know, but oh, there it was. That's the worst, you're going to feel like total <clears throat> shit the next day too when you do And coke. same thing with alcohol, you know, it was, it's like, um, um, go out and get, you know, have a blast one night, you know, maybe drink a little too much, you know, and the next day. 
little hair of the dog, you know, and uh, maybe a little too much hair of the dog. So the next day you need a hair of the dog, you know, kind of thing. And it's a vicious circle. So you got to be careful, um, you know, to not get yourself in a situation where, you know, you're drinking alone and you're drinking every day. Oh, yeah. Because you're, you're missing out on life, you know. You're basically, all of those things you could have done, you know, just got pushed to the side so you can get inebriated, you know. Yeah, yeah. and nothing good comes out of it. Nothing good comes from it. I've you never feel written, like shit. I've never written. A, uh, I've never written anything good. You know, drunk. Yeah. I've never had any great rehearsals drunk. Yeah. You know, even you know, personal practice at home working on music. It's usually half an hour into it, and I'm like, put this thing down. You know, put this instrument down. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not there. It's when you're <clears throat> you're sober and you're totally focused on you know on emotion and 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 music that you really create you know i I've, I've written a couple things stoned you know the felt like deep thought you know just let something pour out on paper and it was pretty cool but not it's not my best work you know <laughs> my best work is definitely being in the moment you know yeah and uh, thinking about what I want to say, what I want to, how I want to say it. You know, because lyrics are, I love lyrics. Lyrics is one of the best things in the world to me. I, I've got lyrics, I've got a box of lyrics that I started writing when I was like 15. And they, they are so cheesy. <laughs> and I, I got them all, you know. Oh, every I song too. I've ever written. And uh, not till I started Kill Jaden. <clears throat> Um, I started writing in a really deep, profound way. And so the thing about songwriting is, you know, you're, you're basically uh, telling a story and you have, you know, four lines in a verse to explain something. And before you get to a, a, a pre-chorus and a chorus or whatever, and you have to be, you, you kind of got to jump over uh, fences to get to the end point, but you have to still be descriptive enough to where people could follow what you're saying. But you have to get to the conclusion fairly quick, or at least to the point. Yeah. The conclusion could be later on, <clears throat> or it could be in the chorus. And I just love wordsmithing, man, on, on how to describe something in, you know, four lines, you know, uh, three verses. A lot of times I write uh, um, a verse, a bridge, then back to a second verse, you know, to really con kind of just give a f further description before the chorus hits. That way you kind of understand the chorus more based off of the, the story I just said, you know. And um, a lot of the stuff uh, I've written in Kill Jane w w was just heartfelt. Compared to the stuff I was writing in my 20s and 30s, it was just I was always trying to rhyme, you know, and, yeah. and cool stuff like the back of my car, you know, the beach, you know, broads, babes, you know, back alley streets, you know, trying to be all, you know, evil and stuff. But shit, um, shit that mattered to you when you were 20, you know, I, when you're, you're not very... You you're not very deep at that point in your life. Right. You're just you're just barely learning how to fucking tie your shoes. You, you know, when you're 20, you're like I'm an adult now, and it's like you were just in high school. And how <laughs> how competent were you in high school? You were a fucking idiot when you were in high school. Let's be real. Complete. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, what else, you know? That's my alarm clock. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. And we have been talking for a while. Oh, I'm having fun. I am too. How about you tell us about some upcoming shows, and we can get you the fuck out of here. Okay, um, we are playing at Vamped October 28th. Um, it's right before Halloween. Halloween's on a Monday, and Count 77's playing on Saturday, the 29th. Um, so Corey Coker offered us uh, uh, the night of Friday, the 28th, and I, I believe we're headlining. We're still working all that out. So if we are headlining, though... 
um, we, we're going to play a good two-hour set, you know, as opposed to a 50-minute set. So, and we got a lot of material. We, get, we're, we got a lot of uh, songs uh, off the new album, which is really taken off in the charts. And uh, a lot of people, we just played uh, last uh, August 28th, uh, opening for Damage Inc., uh, which was a great billing because Metallica and Ghost BC toured together. And so uh, we jumped on that, and uh, after, it was it was a great show because everybody was in the audience wearing all the the ghost memorabilia and shirts and stuff, and and singing all the lyrics. And you know, people were asking for set lists after the show. I think we want, want might want to start printing out a bunch more of those <laughs> and even signing them. And that way, if somebody wants them, just hand them out, whatever. But um, the um, so that was that was a great show. It was packed. Uh, the venue made a killing that night. Uh, we had fun. Damage Inc. had fun, and so here we come again, October twenty eighth. And like I said, I hope I think we're going to headline that. We're still working all that out, but if we do, we're going to be working songs off the new album. We just did uh, three. On, on August 28th, and we're going to add three more for this show. And we're going to add some um, songs from older albums <clears throat> uh, to this next performance. And and then we're working, we're trying to work something out. I think it's in, uh, let's see, uh, October, November. I think in November, middle, of, middle or late November, we're trying to get uh, a show again with Damage Inc., and the bass player's girlfriend plays keyboards in a, well, she did in a ghost tribute band in L.A., and she was at our show. She just loved us. So we got to talking to her, and uh, we might uh, debut her as our keyboard player. It might be just for that show. It might be for duration of time, hopefully. You know, we'll see. But um, really looking forward to that. Hopefully that happens. That's awesome. That should be yeah. fun, man. I hope I can make it out to that. That would be cool, man. I'll get you on the guest list. Oh no, yeah. We'll save five bucks. Much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I that's a I like to pay. Whenever someone whenever someone invites you to their fucking show, they're not telling you to come for free. They're telling yeah. you to come pay the cover at the door. They're working their asses off, people. Unless it's a hundred and eighty-five dollar ticket, then I'll then put me on the guest list. Yeah, then yeah, you don't well. you don't need my money if you're making that much money per ticket. Uh, yeah, but five bucks. You know, yeah, yeah, sure. As a band, you're like you're a promotional entity for like a nightclub. So whenever you you know, it's like you're inviting your friends out. It's like you're trying to get people to go to a bar and spend money, oh, and and, uh, they do. and people misinterpret that as like. Uh, you know, oh, I'm special now because I know the guy who's going to play and I can yeah. get on the guest list. And it's like, sure, we could do that. But it's like you're not actually supporting your fucking friend's band now. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're doing the exact opposite of what he's working his ass off to get done, you know, which is like, get the, you know, pull numbers <clears throat> so pull they can numbers, grow as a band. Well, pull numbers makes the, the venue love you. Yeah. And uh, and and the pull numbers uh, uh, affects the bar tally. Yeah. Right. So over overall, the door, the bar, it uh, you could you could become famous if you were to be a band that just over and over and over just brought a crowd that just m blew up the place. You know. Yeah. And you get to charge. You get to charge more money as a band. More oh, money goes in your pocket. Yeah. It, you know, whenever your friends are actually paying the cover instead of trying to get in for free. You know, real quick, uh, I was gonna say that. When I started Kill Jaden um, in 2005, um, we played at the Cheyenne Saloon a lot, you know, and um, they loved us. And there was a reason they loved us, because um, uh, we would play with bands, you know, in their 20s, you know, um, and, you know, we were in our, our um, late 30s, I want to say, I was like 39, and all the people that I brought, you know, were professionals. You know, they had money. Yeah. And the other bands, their their friends that came in and paid a five dollar, you know, uh, entrance fee, they just drank a twelve pack out in the parking lot. You know. Yeah. And it didn't benefit the bar at all. 
But um, one thing about uh, Jeannie at the Cheyenne Saloon, she booked us as many times as we ever wanted to play because, you know, we'd bring in 60, 80 people, and they would they would all probably drop like $100 at least on the bar, you know? That's awesome. And th- that's a, a winning recipe. Yeah. That's the whole reason everybody's coming together to create that. The bar, the bands, the whole, th- the whole scene, you know? And so that... People can make fucking money. That venue is very important yeah. to, to the music scene, right? Yeah. It's very important without that stage and those lights and, you know, uh, the bar and the, you know, the, the spirits that they, you know, stock. They paid for that in advance, you know. They're not mm. getting that on credit. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> somebody put a lot of money into creating an atmosphere where people can go play, you know. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to demand, you know, thousands of dollars uh, uh, to play on their stage. You, you know, you could be, you can uh, negotiate something that that benefits the club to continue on, you know, in the future, and you know, pays everybody, you know, uh, something that makes everybody happy, you know. But the the main thing is these clubs keep dying because of. Uh, you know, idiots drinking 12 packs out in the parking lot, you know? Yeah. And everybody wanting to get on guest list. <clears throat> yeah. And then the club makes no money, and then it closes down, just like yeah. we were talking about. And, you know, and, and bars, ultimately, you know, they they give freebies, you know? You know, they hand out shots and drinks. They're, you know, they want to be, you know, they want to, they want people to feel like they're welcome, they're, they're liked, they're appreciated, you know, here's a free beer, you know? Um... But some bartenders might go overboard on that and hurt hurt the owner. Yeah. You know, it's a fine balance. It really is, man. It really is. Support your local music scene. Please support your local music scene. It's the lifeblood of, of the entire music industry, man. And with that, I'm going to say thank you so much for watching. Love you, bud. Really appreciate your support. Uh, definitely uh, ch- give us a like, subscribe, ring the bell, follow us on social media, follow Brian on social media. All his links will be in the description below, right down there. And uh, and also, uh, you know, be so kind as to support us on Patreon and PayPal. Uh, this has been To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. Peace. That was fun, dude. That was fucking so fun. Thank you for watching To The Fullest with Jason Froberg. You can check out more podcasts right here and subscribe by clicking right here.